During a recent visit to the Chester Historical Society's Museum at the Mill, I asked curator Diane Lindsay if there were any records in the Society's collection that document how Chester got its name. We both knew that Kate Silliman's Chester scrapbook says that around 1729, Abraham Waterhouse, with his brother Gideon, came to the North Quarter, which was the name given to the area we today call Chester by the settlers of Sabra. About the same time, Abraham suggested calling the northernmost section Chester in recognition of where his ancestors came from when they left England. Had Kate Silliman gotten this information from some historical record, or was this simply a town legend? It seemed unlikely to me that there could be records dating back to 1729 here in the Society's archives. But then, with a smile, Diane said there actually are some documents that probably are that old. And into the archives we went. A nondescript box with the simple label Genova didn't seem important enough to be holding anything that might be that old, nearly 300 years old. I asked Diane about the name Genova. She said this was the name of the family from New York who had carefully preserved these documents for centuries and donated them to the Historical Society. They were direct descendants of our Abraham Waterhouse. Carefully, we put the box on a table and began looking through the folder. I was, frankly, spellbound by what I saw. Here in front of me were survey documents that predated two of the oldest houses in Chester, located on North Main Street. Other documents showed how the earliest roads were laid out, allowing for another of the oldest houses in town to be built on Spring Street. All three of these houses are dated to around 1700. Looking further, we found the oldest document in this amazing collection. It dates from May 8, 1679, when the Court of Election in Hartford laid out the boundary lines between Killingworth, Haddam, and Chester. This document took us back to the very beginning of our town. When the document was drawn up, the Wangunk Indians inhabited Chester with their fort on a hill overlooking the Connecticut River. There was a palisade fort with other smaller encampments along the river heading north. The men who drew up this document had to have met with the Wangunks inside their palisade fort. History tells us that this large hill where their fort overlooked the river was called Patakonk by the Wangunks. Looking more closely at the document, we found it states, we, underwritten, being appointed by the council to run the lines of bounds between Saybrook and Haddam and between Saybrook and Killingworth. This nearly three and a half century old document clearly sets out how these original settlers carved out this chunk of land we today call Chester. Another document dating March 10, 1742 identifies the land surrounding Cedar Swamp Pond, which today is known as Cedar Lake. This was done just a few years before the John Douglas House was built in 1745 on what is now Cedar Lake Road. Next, we found the historical record we originally started looking for. On the survey record is the name Chester. This simple document is the earliest use of that name on any document in the collection of the Chester Historical Society. It was for the division of land that showed the west end of town being settled. And it was from this 1742 document and the years that followed that we see the name Chester being used interchangeably with that of the fourth quarter parish of the Sabra colony. There were other documents in that simple box, a 1742 document with the original wax seal still in place, signed by Samuel Willard, the chief surveyor of land in Chester. Willard was also one of the early slaveholders in the Sabra colony. With his son George, he built one of the first grist and sawmills on Patacon Brook, just one year after the document was written. The mill was located where the wooden bridge that today crosses the brook at the bottom of Wig Hill Road. How many of Willard's enslaved men might have worked at this mill? It should be noted that the enslaved individuals lived in Chester during those days. Among their owners was the shipbuilder Gideon Leet, who built the magnificent home next to the old meeting house. It is said that the rear section had been built earlier, probably around 1710. Of all the documents we looked at, one of my favorite states, we have on here unto set our hands and seals in the 24th day of February in the 16th year of the reign of our sovereign lord, George II of Great Britain, King. 
Yes, when all of these documents were written, we were still a British colony. There were dozens of these old historic treasure documents in that box. They tell us when the boundaries of the town were drawn, how the land was divided, petitions to buy Cedar Swamp Pond, roads being measured, land transactions noting earlier settlers, and even the connection to England as a British colony. These documents preserved in the archives of the Chester Historic Historical Society are a window into a distant past. Yet, after all these years, we are able to find the earliest use of the name Chester, coinciding with Abraham Waterhouse coming to town. The one thing we haven't yet found, though, is anything that documents that he did come from an ancestral home in Chester, England. One of these days, it may still be found. Make a point to visit Chester's museum at the mill, where the Chester Historical Society shines a light on our historical past and where it houses and protects treasures, both big and small.